There's that snazzy, jazzy <laughs> music that everyone loves. I know. Everyone loves our intro music, Genevieve. How I know. About that? I know. I love it. Um, I don't I, blame them. That was, I'm hyped up, man. That was awesome. I know. It kind of gets I you was, going, like, right? I a little bit in the background, <laughs> but anyway, welcome to that GD show, everybody. How yes. are you guys doing? And there's our friend Forrest Valkai. How you doing, How are Forrest? you guys? Super and great. We are so... So stoked to have you here. My girlfriend, Bevan, um, my partner, girlfriend, whatever, she, we, we've been together a while. I don't know what, we, we, it sounds weird at my age to call someone a girlfriend. That's just, I, I just don't know what to, you know what I mean. I understand. I understand. By person. Anyway, she has been so stoked about this. I, when she found out you were our guest and she said, oh my God, I've been following <laughs> that guy. He's amazing. He's brilliant. <laughs> so she has been, and Genevieve has been uh through her mind about this show so we're we're really excited to have you um looking forward to the conversation we have hopefully we'll get some interesting calls um yeah. but thank yeah you so much thanks, for having me this is awesome thanks for coming on Forrest. i really appreciate it's absolutely it absolutely my pleasure this is something you know that this kind of conversation that we get to have on this is not something that i get to do very often on tiktok because uh, their community guideline moderation is bonkers um I did one Ask an Atheist Day thing on my YouTube channel, and it was for like 40 people. It was very small, but I now that thing has thousands of views, and I get more emails and letters and stuff about that than anything else. So, like, this is something that I'm I'm very happy to to do yeah. more of, and especially with you know, see, I've I've actually got to watch a few episodes of your show. They're fantastic. I've been following Genevieve for a long time, so I'm just I'm stoked to death to be here, man. Seriously, well, still blows my awesome. mind. Yeah. Genevieve, tell us how, tell the viewers how we came to have Forrest on our show. Gosh, well, you know, it's so funny because the first couple weeks that I spent on TikTok um, were just kind of surreal in the sense that I made my first TikTok talking about religion and science. And within a couple weeks, I'm on the phone with Dave, who wants to do a podcast together. And I'm like, whoa, like, I'm not anybody, but okay, let's do this. And then <laughs> I, uh, so forest uh you do incredible lives like every sunday answering people's questions about science and it's super fun Thank you. and i had just made i think this was right after i just made a video talking about uh the scientific method via like Karl popper uh, and the differences between einstein and sigmund freud and sort of how that ties into how people deal with religion today and so i just spammed forest and tagged him in a bunch of my videos and amazingly you watched him and liked him and we've been mutuals ever since and of course back then you know you only had what a, a couple hundred thousand followers on tiktok and now here you are with like 1.2 million and like a huge youtube channel and it's just well you made great points thank you i mean it's just it's so that's what i thought too that's why when i saw genevieve's uh tiktoks i i reached out and said this girl is so sharp and I love the fact that she wasn't coming from that evangelical background that I was coming from. So it made for an interesting dichotomy, I thought. Um, but yeah, I'm, I really, I really I'm sorry I'm like moving around so much. I'm trying to find a way to get you guys behind the webcam. So I'm not just like staring over here while trying to talk to you. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, oh, it's a hey, nightmare. Okay. Yeah. okay. Well, go ahead and configure yourself how you want. Yeah, It's um, going to take a thousand years. I'm just going to leave it how it is. We've, we we've got some callers away. coming in and I will get to them in a minute, but First of all, folks, as you know, if you don't know, this is a call-in show. Call us at 217, I have to look at this number, 375-9933. That's WWDD, which stands for What Would Dave Do? That's the question on everyone's mind. And uh, so we, we want you to, to call in if you have questions or comments for Forrest, for me, for Genevieve, for the universe, for God. We don't care. 
Um, <laughs> and I speak for God here on this show. So just so you know, but right. um, please uh, like and subscribe. If you haven't subscribed to my little channel here, we'd love for you to, if you can, uh, we'd love for you to support us on Patreon. Any, any amount doesn't matter. This show does cost us money. Just so you know, we're not making a bunch on this. If you, if you, if you're able to do some super chats, that's great. But, you know, we've had some comments that, that I want to speak to just briefly about, you know, can I put, put timestamps up and put the name of the caller on the screen, help us so we can, and we just don't have the staff for that. This is a bunch of volunteers who give up their time to do this because they believe in what we're doing. So I'm sorry we don't have timestamps, but we just don't have time to do the timestamps because we're all busy doing other things. So um, just watch, you know, watch a bit of it if you want. If you, if you don't want to watch the whole video, that's fine. But we appreciate any of you guys that are viewing and, and following along. We, we just love doing this show. And thank you for the opportunity to come into your homes every Monday evening. <laughs> so for us, I want to, uh, we do have some calls coming in already. So I, uh, cool. I, I want to get to those pretty quickly. Yeah, let's Chad, get Chad, I see you there. You know what, let's do um, cause we can, we can jump back and forth to the conversation we want to have. What we try to do on the show you've seen is if you've watched a couple of the videos, we, we do the calls and we move in and out of a conversation and we talk about, cause I want to talk to you uh, about science and faith and the intersection of the two. Yeah. Um, I come from an evangelical charismatic background that poo pooed science mm. and, and that world wanted to keep you yeah, the scripture says, come to me as a little child, you know, don't think too deeply. You can't trust your own mind, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. That is the ideology that the evangelical world is steeped in. And so I want to, you know, I want to have those kind of conversations. But if you guys are good with it, let's um, let's get to Chad. He, him in Michigan. And his comment here is science will never lead someone to faith in God. Let's just uh -huh. dive right in. What do you yeah. say? Let's do it. Hey, sure. Chad. Or Chad, are you there? Hey, how you doing? Hey, Chad. Thanks for calling in tonight, man. How are you? I'm doing well tonight. Good. Well, you're on with Dave and Genevieve and Forrest Valkai, who is a Hi. an evolutionary biologist. Is that right, Forrest? Is that pretty yeah, much that's correct? Yeah. Okay. That's that's the easiest way to describe myself. That's that's the okay. boilerplate. <laughs> I could okay. go into a lot of detail, but you don't want to hear it. I promise you. <laughs> well, Chad, you've got a comment here. It says. Um, Science will never lead someone to faith in God. So what, what's your what's your take on that or what's your question or comment in that regard? Well, it seems as though, you know, I've listened to several uh, debates with atheists, and it's a lot about, you know, prove that God exists. Um, I, and people trying to share testimonies about, you know, I believe God exists because of this, and then it's a lot of debunking, and it seems as though it's just constantly back and forth, back and forth, and then the atheist just says, you've never really proved anything. And um, so <clears throat> the reason why I believe is because faith is outside of us. Um, it's not something internal, it's outside. So it has to be giving, given to us by God, who is outside of time, and he's the one who infuses faith into us to give us the ability to believe and that's why I believe an atheist will never believe simply by, you know, someone trying to prove their prove God's existence. I don't really think it's possible for me as a Bible believer to prove that God really actually exists. I can't do that for you. So the point kind of goes into science, that science um, really will never lead someone to faith. And I would say science reveals the existence of God, but not really will grant someone faith. So in other words... Um, you can observe the natural, but faith does not come through observing the natural. Again, it comes outside of us. So that's why we call that supernatural. Mm -hmm. okay. So, I mean, right off the bat, I just have a quick question just to clarify is, you know, what when you say faith, like what what do you define as faith? There's a million definitions. It means something different to everybody. Um, what, what would you say when you say that, you know, God gives you this faith? Like what, what is specifically, like what is this faith that you're talking about? Faith is uh, where, where you place your trust into something. You place your trust into an object. And so someone who is a follower of Christ would say their faith is in Christ. They put their faith in Christ where someone coming maybe from an evolutionary background, maybe their faith might be in science. So they put their trust in what science says 
um, to to define basically their worldview and how they see life and and what they what they what they're ultimately ultimately trusting in is in science. I, I will say, just I'll, I'll let you go for us, but I do just want to say that there's quite a few, a majority of Christians who believe in Jesus and trust Jesus and also understand that evolution is real. So I just wanted to make that point. That's that's also quite important. But uh, Forrest, what, what, what do you have to say about this? So uh, one one thing that I'm, I'm confused about by what you said, because I usually when people talk to me about faith, um, you know, it's it's. It's almost synonymous with belief. It's it's I believe this thing is real. I believe this thing exists. Um, and and all the teachings of the religion, all this are are real things. What you said, faith is trust. Um, and then you compared it to you know my belief in evolution, my understanding of how evolution works. It almost seemed like you were comparing it to just a reasonable expect expectation of validity so that something exists. Like I I don't have faith that I am sitting in a chair at this moment. I, I can see that. I don't have faith that this cup exists. I can see this cup. So I wouldn't, I would argue that when we're talking about science, we don't rely on faith. We rely on evidence and we don't have faith in evolution. We can see it. We can watch it happening in, in, in reality. And also over, you know, eons, we can watch the evidence unfolding before our very eyes as we look back, not just through the fossil record, but also through, you know, the uh, genetic evidence and all these other things. But I'm not going to muddy the waters by digging into that. I just mean to, the, the point that you made was that these two kinds of faith, quote, quote, are you know comparable. And I, I don't think that they are. So I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind digging into that a little bit more with me, because I think that your faith in the Bible is strictly that you have the Bible there and that you read it. Hopefully you have. And that, you know, whatever your preachers tell you or, or whatever you feel in church, those are the things that your faith comes from. As for me with science, it, there's no faith involved. If, if new evidence came forward, I would change my mind. There's no nothing that I'm like grounded in besides the fact that I am pretty damn sure that reality exists and that the laws of physics have been the same across the, you know, however many you know, you know, billions and billions of years this universe has been here. So I, I, I don't think those two are comparable. And I think that you're doing it a disservice to, to try to compare the two. I think that you're, you're going to confuse the issue by doing that. What well, do you say I, to that? I, mean, I agree with you about what, what I, I agree with what you're saying about that you're you're putting your trust in something that is observable, right? Like you said, a chair. Like I'm sitting in a chair right now at my house, so I, sure. I it's something that I see. I sit down in a chair because I trust in the chair, right? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I agree with you in that um, we do have evidence, um, but I guess I guess maybe the starting point would be like I would say, you know, God created, so God spoke, and the world came into existence, and that's where science was created. And so because God is, a, I believe, a God of order, that's where things like physics and all these things came into being. So there's order, there's structure to um, everything we see. Um, and so what I'm saying is the faith to believe that, though, is outside of what we observe. It's, and that's where I'm saying it has to be something that is given to us by God. It comes from without, not within. So within, all I have faith in is what I see. But um, um, what I'm saying is that faith in God would be something outside. That's why I could never reason you into faith or I can, I can give you a hundred reasons why I believe God is real and all my evidence, but you would refute it all. And that's what I was saying. Yeah. Uh, I think last well, week. Well, one thing I, yeah, one thing you, you said in the chat the other night uh, in the show is on, that's how you and I connected. You were in the chat room on the perspective and you made the comments that Kenneth and I, Kenneth Leonard and I don't, we wouldn't accept the evidence. And so that's why I invited you to call in with, with, you know, your, your thoughts on this. But one thing you said that I've heard before, and I want Forrest to speak to this, if you can, um, uh, that, that God exists outside space and time. I've heard Christians say that statement many, many times to me, it makes no sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. How, how something can exist outside space and time. Plus how could we know that it does? He does. It does. But uh, the other thing you said just a minute ago is that science proves the existence of God. So I, I would like, can you speak to those two ideas, Forrest, really quick? Yeah, I actually, I, I, I was going to touch on those two things and then one other thing as well, but I'll, I'll start there, um, is that, you know, number one, saying that, that this God exists outside of space and time and, and everything that you just claimed, really, everything that you just talked about, um, those were claims. You were making true statements about how you believe the universe is structured and where it came from and all this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously my first question to you would be prove it. How do, how do you know this? You know, where's your evidence for this? Um, 
and the evidence that you provide, and I'm not speaking specifically to you because I don't know, I've never talked to you before, but the evidence that I always get uh, is, is, you know, faith. It's, it's that, oh, I feel a certain way. Oh, I've read it in, in, in the book of whatever I've, you know, I've, uh, I, I, I have vision. I have a, a, a dream. I, whatever you, oh, but you took it one step further to say that, that science proves God, but it doesn't, there's no evidence for any kind of supernatural, you know, extra universal being. And even if there was, you know, if, if we could say there's something supernatural, if we have evidence for it in the natural world, then it's, natural it's not supernatural at all um and there's plenty of weird shit in the universe we don't need nor to make up you know so you're you're proposing mm -hmm. all these things and you're saying oh well science proves this and presumably because of what you said that there's structure and there's order and there's laws and that goes along with this idea of this god that you have um but like laplace mm -hmm. said to napoleon it works just fine without that assumption we don't need to add this magic in. We don't need to add in this new hypothesis that uh, there's, you know, we know exactly how the universe works. We know how physics works. We know how, astro how uh, you know, astronomy works. We know how, how biology works. We know how chemistry works. Oh, and also there's magic too. And, and that's also part of it, but you can't see it because all this stuff happens all by itself and all this stuff works all by itself all the time. You just need to know that there also is magic and that's probably responsible, but I can't tell you why. Like, why? Why, why would you do all these things? You know what I mean? I mm -hmm. feel like you're you're really muddying the waters a lot mm -hmm. and, and you're working extra hard to try to force this idea in there where it doesn't need to be more importantly than it just doesn't belong. Does, mm -hmm. does that make sense? What do you think, Chad? I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but when you say evidence, I'm saying the evidence of God's existence comes from God. That's where I'm saying it's outside of, us. Like I didn't, I didn't choose to believe him. He chose to reveal himself to me. I was listening to a debate with Matt Delonte when, and he was talking about, you know, if God's real, why I've been debating this for 16 years, why hasn't he shown myself to him? And that's where it's part of why I'd say divine election that, you know, if it's God's, if God is going to choose to reveal himself to Matt or to you or to anyone, it's not, it's not me convincing you. It's God himself who does the revealing or the, uh, you know, well, give, what do you say to of his existence? What do you say to someone like me who used to believe in this Christian God? But I, I believed in the God of the Bible. I believed the Bible was inspired and uh, inerrant and that God had authored it through men of old. And I used to believe in that, but I no, no, no longer believe in it because I came to the place of looking around for the evidence of such God and realizing that he wasn't there, had never been there, and had never been involved in my life or anyone's life around me. So when I came to the place of not seeing any evidence for this God that I'd put my faith in, I let go of the faith because I want to believe things that are verifiable and that can be substantiated. And I want to believe as many true things as possible and not believe as many mm -hmm. false things as possible. What about you, Chad? Um, and I've heard a lot of people who have said that, and, and I would say... Um, my answer is that uh, really, I mean, people can believe intellectually, like they can give a mental assent, but really what Jesus is talking about is that you must be born again. And so I would say someone who is truly born again can never like come to an atheist position. They would never reject the gospel and say that but it's I did. not true that Jesus so uh, I, and <laughs> deny the Bible. That if they're truly but born I did, again, but I again, was by God, it gives us the faith. Because I mean, so I, was, for, for, I was. If I can cut you off, there, my friend, I'm sorry. Life, if you would have met me at 16, 17, hey, okay, I would have told you I was a Christian. Give, give, give right. A second. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I I just want to interject for a second because I, I, I I'm not trying to be rude. I, I feel like you're going down a sermon here with me, and I I really I promise you I've heard it. I the the thing we is what you're telling okay. me is that. Yeah, you have to be born again, and you have to just believe, and he's going to reveal this to you, and it won't work. It. I just want to know how you would respond to someone who was a Muslim or a Hindu or any who said the exact same thing, because they do. They all say the exact same thing. Hey, listen, Krishna has mm -hmm. revealed himself to me and you just have to believe it like a child. You can't have your intellectual versus someone like me who comes up and says, hey, I know that the earth looks flat when you're standing on it, but I promise, dude, math exists and it's round. And like we, we can prove it in a lot of ways. Right. I'm not sitting here giving you blind faith. I'm giving you examples from reality that back up my claims. 
And then you have somebody else who doesn't believe the way that you do, who believes in a totally different God with a totally different set of rules that totally invalidate your own. That's coming in here saying the exact same things you're saying, saying you just have to believe it. It's revealed. It's just it's been given to me. You yeah. can't really be a true Hindu if you think the way you are. And if you don't believe you're going to go to hell. And like, it's just not do, like, would you give that any validity? And if not, why not? And, and why do you expect me to? Well, I'm not trying to preach to you. I'm just trying to share, you know, my understanding and my thoughts. So I don't want you to, I'm not trying to convert you. Like, again, I can't convert you or anything. I can't convert a Muslim. It has to be, again, going back to the work of God. But what I was going to say was I grew up thinking I was a Christian too, um, even though I pretty, pretty much, would, if you narrowed it down, I would have said I pretty much was atheistic, um, but claimed I was a Christian, um, but didn't really believe the Bible or anything until... God gave me the faith to believe. And that's why that kind of goes back to the whole science thing. I think where my, my starting point is that, you know, God spoke this thing into existence. So when I look at a tree or I look at a person, I look at grass, um, you know, I would say that's kind of like confirming that the science of the, that God created that, which I would say this kind of ties in with science. So I would, my, my say, closet door is closed right now here in my recording studio. My closet door right there is closed. And that is proof positive right. to me that Roland, the magic goblin that lives in the closet and disappears every time I open the door, he's in there because the door is closed and it's been personally revealed to me. Do you take me seriously? Um, or do you need me to give no. you something else to back that up? Like that's, that's the, you keep saying that you're not going to be convinced by evidence and that you just, you, there's no way that we're going to convince each other. If you gave me evidence, you would convince me. You're not, you say that you can't convert me. You absolutely can. Give me proof. Give me well, evidence. That, that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, I've given, I give evidence, but that's where I went back to my beginning thing. I can give you a hundred reasons of evidence, but you're going to, you're not going to believe in reasons, it. Reasons, God. Hey, like, Chad, I, like, reasons you, but be, reasons you believe is not the same as evidence. When you're saying you believe you, the reasons you're giving are your personal experience. They're anecdotal. And what Forrest was saying is a Hindu who says he has the same experience with his God is saying to you, I'm my God is just as valid. And both of them can't be right because the God of the Bible that you believe in would say that the Hindu believer is incorrect. I mean, I know I lived in that world. There's only one way. Right. That's what the Bible says. There's one way. I am the way, the truth and the life. So these alternate views of God cannot coexist <laughs> equally. One is right and the others are wrong. That's how it's set up. I agree. So, when you, totally say, when you say that your evidence is reason to believe, you're just saying, this is the reason I believe because God came to me and gave me faith. Well, God came to that Hindu and gave him faith. And God came to Forrest and gave him faith in that goblin in his closet. Why are those views not as valid mm -hmm. as yours? That's the question that you can't seem to answer. Right. And I, I agree. I, I can give you... I can't answer it for you, I guess. I mean, I can give you my answer, but it, you're not going to be satisfied with my answer. I mean, um, like, when you, for instance, when I'm, I'll quote. I'm like, sorry, I, I don't mean to cut you off again. I just, just like, want to just want to throw in there. When when you think to yourself mm -hmm. why you can't answer that, you'll understand why I don't under, why, why I don't believe you. That's the thing. Why, like, the only explanation that you can give me for why the magic goblin in the closet isn't real and your God is is because it's what you personally decided you want to believe. It's because that's of evidence point. that doesn't work for anybody right. else. That's the point. That's not the same as evidence. That's just a personal belief. That is a notion that you carry. That is something in your own mind. And and we just want to encourage you, Chad, to think a little bit broader there and to to open your mind up to 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 realize that's not the same as evidence. Evidence is something that can be tested and proven. Your an anecdotal experience is not the same as that. Can I be, promise I'll cut you off again, whatever okay, you have to say. Yeah, yeah, I go do. Ahead. Just, Chad, before... Well, let me ask... Okay, ahead. you know, you can go ahead first, and and, uh, and, and I'll, I'll talk after you. Well, I was going to say, like, like, okay, when I look at the sunset, right, I see a sunset, you know, and we can look at the mountains, or we can look at the sunset, or we can look at the sky tonight, right? It's dark out. We can go look at the moon and the stars, right? The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. So those heavens are declaring that God exists. OK, so I say that and, and I send you a picture. I ask you to look out your window tonight and you see those stars. You're going to look at those stars and you're not going to say, 
oh, those those are a reflection of God created that. So, but that's no, that, I'm actually, I'm I, so... I'm so glad that you brought this up because it goes exactly into what I was going to address with you, which is, as you know, there are more religions than just one. I think one of the really neat things about humans is that every single culture that exists and has ever existed has had some sort of creation mythology. That's a really big part about being mm-hmm. an early human. You get a bigger brain and you wonder like, oh, what, what's going on here? How did this happen? That's crazy. And also when you look at those stars, you'll see right. those constellations. Those are literally named for other gods with other stories of how those stars came to be arranged. Does that mean that there truly is a Pegasus that's kind of shaped like a square for some reason up in the sky? Is that is there a winged horse up there? Are all mm-hmm. of the constellations, are all of the zodiacs real? Because I can see those. I can see that I was born in the sign of Capricorn. Does that does that mean that I that that has any validity on on who I am as a person? I think that it's important. I think it is so important to humble yourself, not necessarily in the glory of God, but in the breadth of the human experience. Does it make sense to oh, you I'm, that I'm, every single culture has I'm, done? Th- I will finish. Does it make sense to you that every single culture has come up with these stories of how the world was created in so many different ways? And you just happen to believe in the correct one. Isn't it more interesting to say, wow, we have a tendency to make up stories that explain our existence. And that doesn't mean that any of them are true. You say that science will never lead someone to faith in God. But I just don't think that faith will ever lead you to a reliable truth. Go ahead, Chad. I hear your point. Okay. Well, Well, I was just. Go ahead. Go ahead. We'll let you have another word, then we're going to let um, to move on. Yeah. No, I'm totally humbled, too. Like you said, I look at the galaxies, I look at the human body, and I'm just totally amazed at the complexity of it and the beauty of it. And so, yeah, I, I agree that as I, I, as I observe science, I am also humbled by it as well and, and amazed at it. Well, I appreciate, wonder. I mean, I, I, I think we've kind of covered it, and we got some other calls and comments to get to, and, and I wanted to move on, but um, I think – the analysis seems to be that that we're all looking at the same thing. You just assign a faith in God to everything. And we we're more open minded to think, OK, we don't know what this is or why, how this came. But we're going to let the science lead the way. And that seems to be the, the way that the world is improving uh, as science develops more understanding of things. And we change the way we look at things mm-hmm. and we don't we don't need then gods to to. We don't need a God of thunder and lightning because we know how those things work now. Science has shown us that this is what's happening and why. So we don't need a Thor or whatever those other gods are. And that's, I think that's where we, we part company from you is that we're, we're open and willing to let science show us new understandings of, give us new understandings of things instead of locking ourselves into a, uh, archaic, if you will, uh, view of things that was written down uh, generations ago. So I guess that's where we part we company. Have two, two different worldviews. Definitely, but we have two different worldviews. But I, I I appreciate you guys taking my call. And, well, it was uh, a good conversation. I, hope. I would love to unpack yeah. more of this. Yeah, but, call in again. Okay. Call in anytime. We're here every Monday night. We'd love to chat with you more. But thank you for your call, and uh, we had a good conversation and respectful. Thanks, thanks for sure, Chad. for sure. All okay. right, you guys have a good night, man. Okay, bye bye. Okay, thanks for talking to me, man. Okay, Amit, Matthew, thank you for your super chat, $10. Forrest, love your video on gender. Thank Can you. I get your opinion? Oh, by the way, that was stellar. I mean, my God, you crushed it. <laughs> thank you so Can, much. His, his question is, can I get your opinion on where Richard Dawkins is mistaken? You may have seen some stuff going on. He keeps putting his foot in his mouth, apparently. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I wholeheartedly believe that he is wrong. So speak to that, Forrest. I am going to do, um, I'm going to disappoint this person. I genuinely don't know a lot about the situation. I don't follow Richard. I like, I know who he is. He's been a hero of mine for some time on a lot of things, but I don't know what all he said in this scenario. Um, I do know there was one thing, so I'm I'm not going to give too much because I genuinely don't know a lot about it. And I don't want to, you know, before that, before that, Genevieve, do you, I I've only heard snippets of what Dawkins said 
Can you do you I have any one better understanding? Piece, but I don't know the yeah, full implications. I I have not been following. I think he's been saying really just dumb, problematic things on Twitter. But I don't have a Twitter, and I don't really follow. Old man, old Twitter man stuff. Right. I think it's what? old man. I old man ideas about transgender and yeah. And the, yeah. I'm sure I, I heard there was curfew. there was one thing that I did see that was it was about trans people, and it was uh, right. something to do with like you you'd get more in trouble for misgendering somebody than you would for doing some other egregious thing. I, I, I don't oh, know what it God. was. Um, yeah. But uh, if I remember correctly, that was like, he was actually like having a discussion about it. He wasn't like making any kind of a point. He was just right. saying like, Off hey, let's discuss yeah. this. And what does this actually mean? And is this real? And people are like, those are words you said. So now that is your whole opinion. So like, I genuinely don't know the whole scenario. So I, I, I won't speak on it uh, beyond that because I, I don't want to do the person who asked this question a disservice by giving them a shitty opinion that doesn't make any sense. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry to let well, you down. I think, <laughs> I think one of the things he, I think one of the words he used was that gender was binary. So that, so may, maybe speak to know that. Better. Yeah. Well, like, apparently he, he doesn't. Be, if, if that is the case, um, yeah. Let's just that's talk something to that. that we've known isn't a thing for a little while and more and more and more like for the past 10, 20 years um, and more and more, uh, it, it's kind of like the same thing where we talked about like gender dysphoria. Um, gender dysphoria is still something that's a, a psychiatric disorder, but it has nothing to do at all with being trans. It actually is like a disconnection, a derealization. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not going to dig into that too much. Um, but being trans actually also used to be considered like, oh, there's a whole whole other thing here and this must be some sort of thing. And then we learned a lot more about it. We're like, oh, actually, no. There's a neuroscientific basis. There's a biological basis. There's a, a million things going on here. And actually, this is a valid way to exist. Um, mm -hmm. And we kind of just got out of our own ethnocentric model of, oh, everybody has to be boy or girl. And XX means boy and boys do these things and blah, 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 blah. So this is science that is new in terms of like in like my lifetime. But it's not like super duper new. Um, so if Dawkins was oversimplifying things, like uh, I recently put out a video on TikTok where I said that we get our mitochondria from our mothers. That's true. 99.999% of the time, there is every now and then one extra one that comes along from a sperm and who knows how that happened. And But I'm not going to bring that up because it's really freaking confusing and it's going to muddy the waters for everybody. So it might have been that kind of thing where he was just mm -hmm. saying sex is binary because that's the way that we do it for everybody who isn't studying biology. Um, but the fact of the matter is, even if that was the case, you have to recognize that this is a pretty salient social issue at this moment. And it's better to teach the whole truth, even if it's more confusing. And even if it can, you know, that he, he's an educator, his job is to get people to understand science. So I think uh, if that's the case, then he definitely dropped the ball. Um, and blew it. If he genuinely thinks that, then he did, he is behind the curve, and that's fine. Like everybody's wrong on shit sometimes, even if it's their specialty. Um, he just needs to yeah. learn more things. Um, I think that's the general consensus I, I've picked up in in the little things I've seen. I can point you in the direction of plenty of great scientific papers from the past three years that are you know very much confirming. Sex isn't binary. Gender isn't binary. Gen gender doesn't really exist. It's a social thing. And uh, sexual orientation isn't a binary. Gender expression is totally different than what you might call gender, totally different than what you might call sex. And like all of these things are different. None of these things fit into two boxes. Um, mm -hmm. And this is not a, a super duper new idea. But well, uh, for those that don't, the, he mentioned the, uh, the, the chat mentioned the uh, video you did on gender. If yeah. you would um, kind of give the just recap that for those who it's haven't seen super it. duper short summary. Yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah. So 60 seconds or less here is as quick as quick as I can. Like um, a TikTok it, video, 60 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is that, uh, you know, there, there's different levels of understanding things. If I'm talking to a middle school class and I say, hey, your DNA controls everything in your body. That's not true but it's good enough for a middle school class. So most time in, in you know, public schools, we teach people that your sex chromosomes are X and Y. And if you're X, Y, you're a boy and you act like so-and-so. And if you're X, X, you're a girl and you act like this and that. And that's also not true. It's good enough for that level of understanding to get you into other things. The problem is that now, you know, our whole society is structured around this middle school understanding of how sex and gender work. Um, so the way that we determine sex in biology uh, is 
to say the size of your your gametes, uh, whether you have, if you have a bunch of really tiny little gametes, we call those sperm and we call you a boy. If you have a, a very few, very large gametes, we call those eggs and you're a girl. That also doesn't always work, but it's functional enough. Kind of like the whole concept of species. Species doesn't make sense. There's 10,000 different ways to define species. None of them work all the time. It's just a thing that we do to kind of make it easier to categorize stuff, which that's, but, uh, and then gender and gender expression are social constructions of our society and our own uh, expectations of how this sex is supposed to act. Um, and then sexual orientation, again, is another entirely different thing. Uh, so not one of these things is a binary. And when we talk about, especially like when we look at trans people, it's really interesting because you have, oh, and I should say it's not a binary because uh, we define these things with gametes. There are some species that have more than two sides of gametes. There are some species that only have one size of gamete. There are some species that don't have any. And also the whole chromosome thing, there are variations there too. There's X, X, Y, and there's X, nothing. And there's a bunch of, and even if you want to say, oh, well, those are statistical outliers, right? They're still people. They still have lives. You can't tell them what they are. Uh, uh, with trans people, we look into the brain and we see that there are certain parts of the brain that are sexually dimorphic between humans. None of this Victorian BS of like women have small brains. We're talking about parts of the brain, the size of the grain of rice um, and their neural architecture aligns with their gender identity, not with their genitalia. And that's really cool. Um, so all mm. this is to say that people are weird and they're under no obligation to make any sense to you. So that's you, just, exactly you right. just let people be what they want to be. And that's the way that science should work. Uh, and it, it really, the most critical thing to remember is that this whole system of categorization with sex, with gender, with species, with everything, it's essential to learn how to categorize things this way if you want to learn biology. It's essential to learn how to stop categorizing things this way if you want to understand biology, uh, especially That's if good. you want to understand humans. Huge That's part good. of archaeological theory is dismantling these uh, dualisms between gender, between race, between what is and isn't <coughs> alive, between what is culture and what is nature. Um, you have to be able to take these things apart to really understand how different humans have worked throughout the course of, of millennia. So it, it's not unsurprising to say that today, you know, the almost 8 billion people in this world don't fit into two boxes. That's, 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 yeah. I guess that's the whole thing. If I had to cram it down real small. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. That's yeah. Great. You know, it's so frustrating, um, especially, you know, with this pandemic that we've been living in, it feels like a lot of the world is stuck on this middle school understanding of science. Yeah. And it's the, funny thing i mean it's not funny because there's not really anything funny about transphobia it's really fucking stupid and i wish it yeah. would go away it seems like the people who are saying well it's science that you know there's boys and there's girls are are really the people they're the, they're the same people who will look at me like i have two heads because i say that we evolved from single cell species four and a half billion years ago it's yeah it's amazing how how adept people can be at picking and choosing what they do and don't mm -hmm. support in science and that's that's just not that's not how it works that's not how it any is, of this works it is ignorance is bliss ignorance is bliss sometimes it's just easier to stay in your ignorant lane than have to open yeah. your mind up and learn things that are different yeah uh, i want to get back to this conversation but we've had a, a call on hold for a bit and i want to get to her it's chelsea she Hi, chelsea. her in north carolina preparing her will, looking for a good secular therapy, thera charity to donate belongings to. I know you had one you wanted to talk about. So let's, let's get Chelsea on the line. Hello, Chelsea. Hello, Chelsea. Hey, you there? And Forrest. Hi. Hey, how are you, how you doing? So you're looking for a good secular charity. And I know Forrest, you wanted to mention one. So yeah, you want to talk uh, about that? Uh, so, I mean, uh, there, there's a couple of, of great options. Um, uh, the, the one that I had, had mentioned earlier, I didn't realize that we would actually have a call specifically about this. I didn't either. <laughs> I'm, I'm currently working with Team C's, uh, which is... Uh, hey, uh, it's, it's God's plan. There you go. <laughs> yeah, apparently, that's uh, the only answer I can think of. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm currently working with Team C's, which is a, a, a collaborative effort of, of uh, social media influencers uh, all over the world to try to pull trash out of the ocean. Uh, every dollar donated is a pound of trash removed, and they're trying to hit a mark of 30 million pounds of trash or $30 million raised by the end of the year. They've already raised uh, about, uh, last I checked, somewhere around $7 million, $8 million um, mm -hmm. within, since we started on Saturday. Um, 
So that's a radical thing if you're interested. Uh, obviously, this isn't going to cure the problem, but it is something that hopefully will draw more attention and help push world leaders to remember that they are, in fact, world leaders and can do things about that. Um, other uh, uh, great things, uh, gosh, it's, it's, it's hard to think of any off the top of my head. What I would recommend is, is you know, going around your own community and finding uh, uh, places that help out here in Tulsa. I don't know if they're still here anymore, but a little while ago, we had this place called Iron Gate, which was a, a, a place that just fed homeless people. Um, and they were the only place in town that I could find that didn't require you to sit through a sermon, that didn't require you to do a Bible study, that didn't require you to do drug screening, anything. They just gave out food. Um, and that sounded rad. And that's something that I was able to help out with that donated the people that live in the same town as I do. Um, so like, that would be kind of cool. Uh, but beyond that, I, I didn't have anything prepared uh, as far as like donating <laughs> a bunch of belongings. Um, I was just going to encourage people to help clean up the ocean. But holy crap, what an awesome thing that you're getting to do now to try to figure out what kind of impact you're going to make on the world. Was that helpful, Chelsea? Right. Um, I also had another thing I'm going to talk about now that y'all mentioned being trans, like, I mean, trans topics. Is that sure. fun? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, when y'all hear my voice, I'm, I'm part of the, first I need to clarify, I'm part of the binary portion of the trans community. I'm, okay. I'm not going to say which one, but which one do you think I am? Male or like, not am, but um, how I sound like, you know, when I talk and how, how I sound, you know, to you. It, male or female do i sound male, male or female to you and i want an honest answer because i'm trying to work on my voice <laughs> well i was uh, oh go sorry, ahead forrest i'll let you jump in i was going to say that the 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 cadence to your voice in particular sounds feminine to me but i genuinely wouldn't presume unless you asked me directly like that i wouldn't have presumed uh because i've met a lot of people with you know, I've I've met women with deep voices. I've met men, men with high voices. I try to go more by like the candor and the way they speak, and and to me that hits me as feminine for you. So, yeah, that's basically what I was going to say. Okay, yeah. and me too. But and your your call says she her is how you identify. So I was gonna probably just assume. That yeah, that's, I know that's kind of dead giveaway. <laughs> yeah, you, I, I had a little um, edge there. <laughs> Yeah, you definitely had an edge. <laughs> but um, what was the, what are other, Dave, did you have any um, secular, did you know of any secular, like around North Carolina or something like that? Because that's where I live. Well, I'm always, my charity of choice, not charity, but it's a nonprofit, is recovering from religion because that's the water I swim in. And I know so many people personally yeah. and so many stories of people who've been traumatized. I was just talking with a, a young woman today who, who came out of a very fundamentalist evangelical world and is, is really catching a lot of flack from her family. And it's just been a bucket load of trauma that she's had to swim through. And she's doing a great job. She's got a good therapist and, and working hard. They also have a branch of their uh, nonprofit called the Secular Therapy Project, which connects people to clear, as someone put it in the chat, but um, who vetted secular therapists who do not let their mm -hmm. religion bleed into their therapy, which I'm a big proponent of. So I'd, that's, that's nice. one that, that I would uh, always recommend to anyone. And they have ways to, 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 you know, turn those belongings into cash that they can actually use to support their mm -hmm. uh, ministry, if you will. Um, but that, that's, that's my, uh, my go-to all the time, but I love, Forest is one to clean the seas. My goodness, well, that's also a, if, if you're looking for something else. I, I'm sorry I didn't think about this earlier. Uh, one, I'm a member of the National Center for Science Education. Uh, that's another great one if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, they are uh, sort of like the ACLU for science classrooms. They make sure that real science is taught in a real way. They provide resources for teachers and also help keep things like creationism and climate change denial and everything out of public schools. Um, that's so that's pretty rad. Into that, and that's called National Center of Science. What? Education, the National Center for Science Education, the NCSE. They're pretty cool. Um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think about other ones. Uh, uh, Girls Who Code one. is awesome. Girls Who Code is really, really cool. Mm -hmm. um, right. Girls Who Code, it's uh, encouraging uh, young women to get into coding, especially into, you know, they do all sorts of robotics and cool things like that. Hmm. Uh, 
Leah's STEM mm -hmm. really needs to be more feminist and more inclusive because it has a history of being very much not, uh, and it's shameful and, and a problem. And also it helps kind of tear down societal issues because you find a lot of times when you're teaching coding to, to, to young girls, they'll come up and say, I can't do this, it's too hard. And you check their screen and they have pages and pages of perfect code with one mistake. But we teach young women in this country that it's better to not show up than not be perfect. And so it's kind of helped break through that kind of barrier and get kids into science. Um, so that's a really, really awesome. cool one as well. I think... I think there is a, a specific one that is also black girl, uh, black girls who code that is also mixing in uh, black feminism as well, which is really rad. So those would be a couple of cool science. Some good choices. Really good choices, Chelsea. You got a few to choose from. Yeah. Yeah. Or the Ocean is. Conservancy. If you're, into, um, if you're into Team C's and you want something that's a little bit more long term. I, I like all the choices. It's hard to choose from now. You gave me so much. <laughs> well, maybe you, know, you could split it up and do a several. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something you always want to do when uh, just looking for yeah, any do, I, do, I can is, name uh, some. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say something that you always want to do is just, you know, really like dig into the organization itself. Like see how they structure, see how much of their donations go straight to overhead yeah, uh, versus like point. actually going out to help people. Mm -hmm. um i'm i don't have a website off the top of my head but mm -hmm. i know that there are organizations that sort of like keep a grading system of different nonprofits, so you can make sure that the money that you're donating is really going to be used for what people say it'll be used for um I'm yeah i work in the non charity watch.org is one i'm checking right now yeah yeah perfect yeah, yeah. that's it yeah so well, that's I a love great what you're doing I, yeah that's a great thought chelsea we appreciate you checking in on that good to hear from you again Yep, charitywatch.org. You can yeah, vet whatever better, charity actually. you're going to donate to and see if By they the actually way. do what they say they're doing. Yeah, you said you're doing better. That's great. Yeah, Chelsea's a regular caller, and we appreciate you checking yeah. in again. Glad to see you're doing better, Chelsea. Yeah, thank you so All much, right, Thank you so much. Well, thanks for your support. Thanks for the call. And you you take care now. Good luck making your mark in the world, Chelsea. Take thanks care. so much. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right. Ciao. Ciao. She's a, that was delightful. Yeah. That was an awesome. Yeah, call. isn't that great? By the way, there was another call. We did. It looks like he dropped off. Um, Lou from New Mexico just wanted to tell Forrest he liked his video on gender again oh, and and sex and wants to encourage you to expand it into a book. Now, uh, well, if you're interested in books, uh, Joan Roughgarden is a, a an amazing scientist out of Stanford University. She wrote a book called evolution's rainbow um it's a fabulous detailing of everything that i talked about and a lot more there's another one called sexing the body uh then i cannot remember who wrote that off the top of my head but it's a very identifiable cover it's a woman with her hands folded between her legs you can find that one on amazon for nothing um that's another one that really digs into that uh something it's like biological exuberance i believe it's called it's got a picture of a cassowary on the front um mm -hmm. that's a cool one that's really good i don't remember uh and also look up if you, anybody wants to know about, you know, uh, uh, inclusivity, intersectionality, feminism, uh, race uh, theory, and, and all those things, uh, look up uh, Kathleen Sterling. Um, she's an archaeologist. She wrote a paper called, I believe it's just called Black Feminist Archaeological Theory, uh, but it's, it's fabulous and it's an easy read and it's not very long and it's just one paper and that will open a million doors to you. And plus the reference section is a, a beautiful rabbit hole to go down. So now, those are some things you can that, look up that, that are better written, books than I will ever write. Have you not written a book? Are you going to? What are your thoughts on that? God, oh, well, when I have time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have no plans on it right now, but maybe someday if, if my head gets big enough and my, my schedule gets clear enough, I'll write a book. But uh, as of this moment, uh, it's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> I'm if, juggling too if, many things. If this. you did, if you had to write a book, what would the subject slash title be? How would you, what would you narrow it down to for us? I would say the thing that I, I am the most passionate about um, is is positivism, which is the idea that that there are answers, there is real a reality to learn things about. So the basis of science is that there is evidence to go be found about how reality works. Mm -hmm. um, uh, positivism and and uh, just the the guiding light that it can shine on literally everything. Uh, how science can be a, something that we we work. Uh, uh, in, into every in aspect of our lives, um, how we as a society could deal with issues like racism 
if we could understand the science that race does not exist, uh, but also use this critical lens to then go back and look at how this fallacious concept has affected our history and not get muddied up in the like, well, I didn't own slaves, so therefore I'm not racist. Um, uh, how transgender uh, 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 or transphobia should, should wouldn't be an issue if we actually taught people the real science of how sex and gender worked. Hmm. How creationism wouldn't be an issue if we actually taught the reality of, of how the Big Bang and how evolution works. Um, how so many, how we wouldn't be sitting here you know, in a climate crisis, the ocean was literally on fire a little while ago. I don't know if you remember. Uh, while we still have, you know, people in, in in the highest positions of power who are denying the fact that the temperature fluctuates at all. Uh, so, like, it, it's not a matter of having political debates and it's not a matter of uh, of having a philosophical discussion. It's a matter of reality exists. And if we paid more attention to it, we'd be we get a lot farther. And That's if good. we realigned our values towards that we would have a brighter future. And then the second half of the book would be all about the future that I want to set up when I rise to power and, and, and change the world. <laughs> when you're in charge of the world, you'll fix it, right? And we'll, oh, we'll be an intergalactic species overnight, yo. It, it's, oh. it's bonkers. Well, that sounds yeah. pretty interesting. Don't you Genevieve? Have a, uh, don't you have uh, some plans, what is it, to mine Mercury or Venus? <laughs> I don't know if you want to get me started on this road, Genevieve. We will, oh, this was going so well. People I might have know. taken me seriously. I know. How yeah. did you rail well, that? The whole thing is, you see, I'll be, again, very brief here. Very brief. Uh, I, I think that it's dumb that we, in the 21st century, with airplanes and vaccines and robots on Mars and, and, and all sorts of great, incredible things, are still crawling around in the dirt like stupid monkeys, begging for scraps of food and water and shelter and equal rights. It, in medicine, it's, it's nonsense. We should be past all this by now. We should have grown up as a species. So my whole jam is uh, that we should you know, handle our biz as a civilization and then go mine mercury into non-existence for resources. Use that to build a, a Dyson swarm around the sun. Use that energy to clean up our environment and invest in biomedical technology and then terraform Venus and use Venus as Earth number two and then expand out into the solar system. It, it, it's, it, I have a, it's a real plan, y'all. Okay, I have a real so plan. <laughs> with, that, with that plan in mind, what you said, we, we're 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 not progressing as a species, as a society. What has kept yeah. us back? Oh, the uh, stupidity. Same thing that always keeps us back. It's, it's the idea that money and power over other people are the most valuable things in our society. Um, okay. And that needs to change. Uh, especially the fact that we, you, when you look at, when, when you study other cultures and we study especially other humans uh, or, or, or early humans, um, you see that the way that we have our, whole social conscience structured the way that we we see ourselves um isn't the only way to exist and, mm -hmm. and isn't the best way to exist uh the more you study history you start to realize that just because something's the way it's always been and just because it's uh you know uh, handed down for generations and it's been the way that uh, from this sacred text or from this special person or from whatever none of those things mean that the idea is good or that the practice is, is equitable or, or helpful um, and so I think that the, the whole thing is that if we looked at every single thing through a critical lens and we questioned absolutely everything about our society, by the way, criticism and questioning does not necessarily mean rejection. It just means, you know, trying to, you know, really look at it through a right. new idea, um, that, that, uh, that would probably open up a lot of doors for us and we wouldn't have stupid, outdated practices and stupid, outdated, you know, uh, systems and stupid, outdated ideals, um, we would be able to do away with those very quickly because we wouldn't have to deal with, well, this is the way it's always been done. And this is the way that my grandpa did it. And well, mm -hmm. I read it in a book I like, or well, this really important person did it this way. We would just handle ideas the way that we are, or the, yeah. the way they should be. So for example, I made a video a little while ago showing a Postmates robot crawling around. The, I know I'm rambling the most you know pedantic That's platitudes okay. here, but a, a great example of this is right. that... Uh, I made a video a little while ago showed a Postmates robot having to maneuver around a homeless person on the street. This is a self-driving autonomous machine full of food that is using this incredible engineering power to maneuver around a person who is destitute and hungry. What the fuck are we doing? Right. If we have the technology to do that and we still can't figure out, hey, 
Humans, I learned in, in kindergarten, it turns out, need food, water, and shelter. Let's make sure everybody has that mm -hmm. uh, without having to get into an argument of, no, that's socialism. Okay, well, what's yeah. socialism? Socialism yeah. is when the government does things that aren't war. And like it's it, they don't know. <laughs> what and we have to have this whole back and forth of argument about that. Um, and then we get okay. Into that's like the best war. quote ever. When the government does <laughs> things that aren't war, oh my god! We, we have to get into the whole argument that the first caller said of you can't convince me with evidence, and I'm like, but yeah. the, the here's here's actually like studies and and real practices that work and that help human lives, and just I think that if we centered our our morality and our ideals around human health and well being instead of you know shiny shit and and pretty rocks and it's just you know yeah i don't think that i don't think that i'm the crazy one for thinking that we can do better than this you know what i mean that's the whole thing is i feel like i'm talking to a kindergarten class like come on guys let's get along hey john lennon so said it fun. john <laughs> lennon said it years ago and i'm not the only one he said yeah you might you might think i'm crazy but i'm not the only one absolutely absolutely yeah. and that's the problem is that you know that when when we talk about these things, when we talk about, for example, healthcare, the first thing that comes up is who's going to pay for it. And my first yeah. response is who fucking care? Why does that? Why does that matter? If you know human beings are suffering, why are you caring about anything else? When we so talk about the pandemic and, and people are like, oh, well, only this many people died. Right. I care when people die. Why right. is that? We, a pro why are we having to sort that out now? So greed and stupidity you mentioned, but you didn't mention religion. And I'm going to touch on that because that's, that's in what both of them. About. What are you talking about? That's what we talk about here. But uh, by the way, folks, hit the like and subscribe. I always forget to do that. Patreon, <laughs> if you can. Call in. We've got lines open, 217-375-9933. we got another half hour. If you want to call in, we'll get you on. But here's the thing, Forrest. Yeah. Um, evangelical Christianity, fundamentalism, the world I came out of, Mm -hmm. teaches that Adam and Eve started it all. The original first two, uh, original sin is, is the big bad boogie. Because uh, as in Adam all fall, and so in Christ shall be all, all be made new, is what Paul said. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would venture that you would agree with me if I said that, it's, that Adam and Eve, the Adam and Eve story in the Garden of Eden is, cannot be compatible with the idea of evolution. Yeah. They, those two cannot coexist. Right. So is that, and, and just venture a guess with me, you and Genevieve both, um, Christianity, evangelicalism fights evolution. I, I just saw one of your videos. Uh, you were going through a video of, of a sweet young couple, and uh, they were so cute trying to debunk John evolution. Jake? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> pull, pull, pulling shit out of a trunk and trying to debunk evolution. And you were so patient and so kind. And and I'm just thinking, oh, my God, how is his head not exploding right now? Because mine was. But I would venture to guess that the reason that evangelicals fight evolution so hard hmm. is because if it's true, Adam and Eve can't be true. Yeah. And if Adam and Eve aren't true, then original sin's not true. And if there's no original sin, then we're not born sinners and we don't need a savior. And what's the point of Jesus? And it all falls apart. Am I wrong? Yeah. I would say exactly to all of that. That's yeah, that's that's one thing. And, and, and well, two things, actually. Number one is that you're absolutely right. Is, if I could give if if anybody takes anything away from anything I've ever said or done, I hope it is the fact that you talking to you, whoever's watching this, you are not sick. You are not broken. You are not diseased. You are not sinful. You are not dirty. You Thank owe you. nobody an Thank explanation you. or a justification for who you are. So be your fucking self because salvation standing, is already at hand and it comes from in here and in here. Um, standing ovation, motherfucker. Thank you. Standing ovation. Uh, and and I, I hope that's something that we can get out more because the, the second part of that is that you hit the nail on the head a second ago when you talked about, you know, I, I mentioned greed and, and stupidity and you said, well, what about religion? That's the point. It's yeah. to keep you ignorant and it's to keep you greedy it's to teach you that your life is important and your eternity is important and and that uh you don't question and don't think you look up stephen hassan's bite model of, of thought control and and behavior control and information control and emotional control and it falls right in line with every single thing they do at a sunday service um they, they this this all falls in to uh, just keeping people subservient, which is is a very useful tool of religion. And that's why I never, ever come across and, and say, like, religious people are stupid. I never come out and say, like, I hate religious people. I hate religions. Religious people have been hurt. They've been lied to. They've been abused. Exactly. 
And they are now passing on that abuse in the exact same cycle that almost every other kind of abuse gets passed on through. I know if you're, if you're spanked a bunch as a kid, you probably think that violence is a good way to solve an issue. If you are taught these horrible things that you were born evil and you deserve Mm -hmm. to burn forever because of just the way you were born. But if you crawl around and grovel and beg enough, maybe you'll be worthy of something. Then you're, that's how you're going to see other people. And when we talk about public policy and we talk about making the world a better place and we talk about, you know, uh, uh, social justice and we talk about climate change, 40% of this country believes that the world is going to actually literally end within 50 years. 40% of this country thinks that the clouds are going to part and Jesus is going to come down and nothing matters. Why would you clean up the earth if it's going to end in 50 years? Do you take care of the carpet when the landlord is going to replace it next week? No. So why would you do that? And so like, these are things that are, are not just wrong. They are actually harmful, not only to our society as a whole, but to individual human beings. They, they, they damage you mentally and emotionally. And it, it is, it is literally abuse. Um, and I agree. It's, it's I, that that idea of being born broken that that little babies are little but little dirty rotten sinners uh, that it is kills the most. Me. Sw- I don't know if I'm ever going to reproduce, but if anybody ever tells my kid that Jesus loves them, I'm going to knock him the fuck out. Like you don't say that to a <laughs> child. My God. Oh my God. That was a I, that was excellent. I mean, Forrest, you nailed it. Um, you you hit the nail on the head, Genevieve. What do you have to say with what about what Forrest just said? My God, that was brilliant. You're muted. You're muted. I'm, I'm mute. sure what you're saying is great, though. Yeah, let's hit, let us all hear it. <laughs> She's. Uh oh. I think we lost Genevieve. You there? Uh-oh. Sign to tell us through interpretive dance what you want us to know. We still can't hear you. It's okay. We won't just stare at you awkwardly and do nothing else until you get it fixed. No, well, I that think what we'll do. We're gonna all. we're gonna we're gonna take a call and then let Genevieve come back on if she can find the unmute button. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with her. She's uh, she's so funny. Um, we've got Anton Gomez. Uh, what about when religion helps people out of addiction? You want to take this oh, call? Yeah. I okay. would love to. Okay. He, he and him. Hello. Hello. Oh, gotcha. Anton, he and him. Hey, you're on with Dave and Forrest. I think Genevieve will be back in oh, a minute. She had to read. She's dead. It's all but, over. Uh, no, she's coming back. I know her. <laughs> Anton, uh, you want to talk about when religion helps people out of addiction? Oh yes, uh, you you uh, snatched me right out of the call screener. <laughs> well, I jumped. Um, I, I jumped right in, man. My, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I have been uh, before in like uh, sort of a rehab facility, and um, w- when people have uh, addictions, they they uh, well at least I, I guess it's common for for religion to like like chime in, right, and help people out of addiction. Uh, the way I, I was taught, it was like, uh, surrender yourself to, to Jesus. Yeah. So, and, and these people in, in the clinic, in the case of my personal experience, uh, they do turn their lives around. So, uh, I mean, what would you say about those kinds of uh, cases? So the, the, the most important thing is that, like, um, when you talk about religious uh, rehabilitation, the first thing I think of is the, the 12 step programs, things like Alcoholics Anonymous and whatnot. Those are very, very religiously based. Um, and a huge part of it, like you said, is surrendering yourself to to Jesus and to uh, going out and trying to correct all of your wrongdoings and all these different things, which sound really pretty on the surface. But what they're really doing is they're enforcing this idea that you are already so fucked up that you couldn't have possibly done anything else but become this horrible, disgusting addict. And now, through grace and salvation, you might be worthy of some sort of love. Um, it's an incredibly emotionally abusive way to, 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 beha- to treat somebody. Um, and when you see the, the turnaround rate for those things, yeah, a lot of people do turn their, rights or their lives around and then go right back into addiction later because these are not actual sustainable healthy practices. And if they do stay clean later on, um, it's, it's through fear and bullying, not through actual personal growth. So these things don't have a very high success rate. Um, the success rate they do have I've, is not a happy thing. Um, 
And it's basically just replacing one kind of abuse with another. It's, it's mm -hmm. starting with, you know, this self abuse of, of addiction and, and hurting yourself because it's something that gets you through something for, there's a million reasons that addiction exists. I'm not going to try to lump it all into one thing. Um, and you're replacing it with this other kind of abuse of this slave master in the sky that's telling you how to behave. And if you do these things, then, then maybe you won't be so hideous anymore. Um, it's, it's very, very self detrimental and, and not, I, I, and then the second thing I would say also is, you know, you you come up with a good example of, hey, religion helps somebody in this way. OK, what about the 10 billion examples where the exact same religion did hideous things? You know, what about all the examples of people who literally beat their children to death because in the Bible it says to spare the rod is to spoil the child? Um, what about the incessant uh, abuse of, of young women? What about genital mutilation? What about all these other things that religion does as horrible? Um, mm -hmm. You just you can't just throw one thing out there and say, oh, well, a good thing happened this time and ignore all the times that bad things happen or when that good thing doesn't work. Um, it's, it's just you're, you're reading the marketing pamphlet and not seeing the reality, if, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah. What do you think, yeah. Anton? When you yeah. say it like uh, uh, when first, like if you were saying uh, that the religion teaches you that you're broken and all of this. And I am familiar with that. I, I know that religion does that. But. In my personal experience, when I was in this clinic, they, they didn't really say that. It was um, more on the lines of, okay, well, you you fucked up, basically. Whatever it is that you um, ended here, I mean, you, you made a mistake in your life. And to be able to overcome this, you, you clearly haven't been able to do it by yourself. Therefore, you need a higher power. So something along those lines, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. So, yeah, yeah. So, I. Wouldn't this be. Uh, no, finish your thought, please. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, th no, that's. Yeah, that's, uh, okay. that's basically it. I was going to jump oh, okay. on something else. Yeah. You know, I I have actually talked about this quite a bit. I, I don't have any studies or anything to back up what I'm saying besides just my own observation. But, you know, it's amazing how many friends I have known who can be so self-sabotaging because they say, oh, you know, if, if you knew me, you'd know I'm a terrible person. I'm not worthy. And, and, you know, I've noticed that with a lot of people, there is this cycle where sometimes the most difficult thing in the world is to forgive yourself for any past mistakes that you've done. And then sometimes in that case, like that's where um, sometimes addiction can sort of be like a crutch of dealing with that. It can be sort of like this like self-fulfilling prophecy of like you know i am not worthy because i have done terrible things and nobody should love me and so then you push your friends away and then you kind of act like a dick because you you know you don't believe that you deserve that and i think this is something that makes uh, in particular christianity so powerful for people is that you might not be able to figure forgive yourself but they tell you that jesus forgives everything and i've noticed that so often just all that you need to move on and improve your life and be happier is to let go of whatever has happened in the past and leave it in the past. It's the most difficult thing to do. But I know just from my personal experience, I didn't get to grow and blossom and become a happier person until I forgived myself for the messed up things that I did in the past. It's, you know, everybody makes mistakes. And I think that that's where Christianity is so powerful. I can't forgive myself, but Jesus does. And so then I think you're sort of, you're accomplishing the same thing there. It's just, you know, instead of, instead of you just saying, oh, I've, I've moved on and I accept what I've done and, and I forgive myself. Now it's just, it's the same thing. It's you are forgiving yourself because Jesus, I don't think actually exists and interacts with people in the world, but it, it has the same effect you know, it gives you a clean slate. And sometimes that is all people need. Like that is sometimes that's mm -hmm. all you need is to be able yeah. to move on. And I think that's exactly why, you know, people say, oh, wow, I, I, I found Christ and suddenly I, I'm cured and I'm so happy. It's like, well, yeah, of, of course, like you, 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 you stopped doing all of these harmful things and it's not because of the grace of God. It's because you've like finally just like allowed yourself to to move in this direction. I think that doing anything outside of yourself is is a pretty good thing to do to be a happy person. Um, I, you know, I I like to 
do what I can to engage with the world and hopefully like try to make it a better place and, and do things not for myself, but for the benefit of other people. And like psychologically, we know that makes you really happy. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's correlation, not causation. Yeah. I, if I could also build off of what Genevieve was saying, because that's, that's a fantastic point talking about, uh, you know, that the, you, you feel hurt and you have something that can forgive you even when you can't. Uh, and also, you know, Anton, you mentioned that this, the centers that you've worked in, they don't have this self-hating uh, kind of religiosity. Uh, they, they really teach, you know, all this forgiveness and everything. I, I would just throw in there, like, what do you think is better and more effective? What do you think is going to have long-term better effects? Either teaching someone that, hey, it's all over. Don't worry about it. Everything you've ever done this bad, pfft, already taken care of. Forget it. Who cares? Or teaching that actually having like therapy and saying, Hey, here's how you can learn self-love. Here's how you can learn self-forgiveness. Here's how you can stand on your own two feet. When you said that these people, you know, they, they can't support themselves. So they have some higher power that can support them. What about teaching them to support themselves? What, mm -hmm. why, why put this new crutch in their life? Uh, it would be a lot harder work and it would be a lot of a longer road, but this would be something that would actually empower them rather than giving them a new power to bow to if that makes any sense. Thoughts on that, Anton? Yeah, well, yeah. Um, well, in, in my case, uh, it was not entirely uh, religious. Um, the people that were in the clinic with me, they were religion and actual therapy with, with uh, people that were uh, licensed in, psychologists and whatnot. The two things were hand in hand. Right, it, it was not just purely uh, religious. Purely uh, okay, just just submit yourself to to Jesus or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand that it would be better to be more secular about it. But in, in this case, l l like just focusing on this one uh, example of my experience, what, why would I? Um, let, let's say I go back, and w what would I tell the people? You, you all are deluded, deluding yourselves. Uh, I, I think wouldn't it be detrimental? Like, well, I think it, it's it's not. It, well, you don't want to tell them they're deluded, but I think uh, to to Forrest's point, and I think if you start from the premise that I'm broken and dirty and a sinner, you're going to play down to that self-image. And when you, like Forrest was saying, when you exchange one crutch for another, when you exchange your addiction for a dependence upon God, in other words, you, you're not dependent on drugs or alcohol anymore, but you're dependent upon, you, you forever stay in that place of dependence from, you know, and, and uh, truthfully, I've never dealt with an addiction to that degree, but uh, other than when I was addicted to Jesus and I got free from that after 30 something years, but I'm just kidding. But, um, if you if you exchange one dependence for another, you're still dependent instead of being independent, instead of being a free flowing moral person who's who's in control of their own life. What, what religion teaches us is that we're not supposed to be in control of our own lives. That's bullshit. We are supposed to be in control of our own lives. In fact, we're the only ones who can. And if we if we're not, then we're dependent on someone else and we stay in that place of dependence our whole lives. And from what I've seen with AA and these other groups. They keep you going to those things for the rest of your fucking life. I mean, you're never, you, they always say, well, you're always an addict. You're never, you're never done. You're always an addict. Who says, I mean, why? And so I know that some things are harder to kick than others. And I don't want to minimize that challenge for anyone. Uh, please don't misunderstand me, but to exchange that dependence on a, on a substance for a dependence on a deity or a higher power is just, like Forrest said, swapping one crutch for another. So if I were to say to those groups who depend on some kind of religious, and, and they do kind of uh, soften it by calling it a higher power, but that's just a smokescreen for a deity, a God, uh, some kind of a supernatural presence in my life. And I would just say to them, I think that that's not, help, that's not healthy in teaching people to be independent moral agencies in control of their own lives. That's all I would say. I also, yeah. I, I don't think it's reasonable to say that you'd have to go there and say, hey, you're all crazy, you're all deluded. No, like that. You, not at all. You can, you can separate the two. You, know, you can deconstruct the religion and 
and, and at a different time and help them see that they have been in control all along and that all of these things have been their accomplishments, not God's. Because at the end of the day, I, I genuinely believe that for all the good work, yeah, you said that this isn't entirely religious, uh, for all the good work that all the rest of this organization is doing, all the help that they're giving, the religion is taking away from that. It's, it's detracting, mm -hmm. it's hurting. Mm -hmm. And so you have, you know, you're helping these people find jobs, you're helping them find houses, you're helping them get medical attention, you're helping them kick addiction, and you're also giving them something that's hurting them and, and bringing them down. Yeah, and you so don't have to add that to you it. Don't, that's the yeah, point. you don't have to go in there and say, hey, guess what? Surprise, we all lied. You're all crazy. You, But, you know, freeing them from religion as a secondary thing would be awesome. And there's some, one of my favorite things to do, especially when I work, work with high schoolers, is tell them, hey, by the way, at the end of the lesson, uh, everything that we just taught, I pulled out of a college textbook. You guys are smarter than you think you are. And if you can talk to these people and say, hey, by the way, you just, you know, you kicked your hat and everything. Also, you did it on your own. Exactly. You, you may have you may have occasionally kind of tried to put blame somewhere else in your head, but like at the end of the day, it's you standing on your own two feet. You're stronger than you think you are. That mm -hmm. I think is a much more powerful message. Something that will help them in the long run a lot better. Does that help, Anton? Yeah. Yeah. That does okay. Help. Yeah. Uh, my my thought right. was I, I yeah. You know, I, I, I will just I will just say, too, of course, you know, when you're talking about people who are at a very low point in their life, you know, yeah. I I'm I obviously, hey, I'm here. I am an atheist. I don't believe in God. And I will talk to people about their religion as often as they want to. I, I love it. But I'm not going to go to somebody who is in a very vulnerable place and say, hey, by the way, let me just try to rip that faith out from underneath you real quick. You know, right. like, I think, yeah. you know, we do have a moral imperative. I understand how important faith can be for somebody. So, like, I'm not I would never advocate that we treat every single believer the same exact way. Um, yeah. Anthony Magna Bosco was one of our first guests on this show, and he you know, practices street epistemology. And he's got these hard line rules where it's like, oh, if I see somebody's in in like a emotional crisis or that I think think that you know they might end up hurting themselves or spiraling if they lose this god belief at this point in their life then he disengages and i think that's really important to remember you know we're not we're not monsters that want to yeah. you know, just rip bibles and burn them good point the Genevieve. yeah so just just well, important to note we'll let you go anton we're almost out of time for this show but thank you for your call and your support we appreciate it man thank you so much dave you take you take care anton Bye, Anton. Bye-bye. He came to us from Mexico City, Mexico. Nice. Um, that's cool. So we've only got about uh, 10 minutes left. We always don't want to we, – we run up against a, a sharp hour and a half, but we could talk forever with you, Forrest. Um, you know, what What do you – I know you're, you're – tell us what you've got going on, what you're doing, why you call – who you call yourself and, and what that means. So I, uh, I, I'm a, I, I call myself evolutionary biologist because it's the easiest way to describe what I do. I am a biologist. I specialize in, in studying and understanding evolution. Uh, my degrees are in education, general biology, integrative biology with an organism concentration, which is studying the individual lives of organisms and, and how they evolved and where they came from. I did a lot of undergraduate <laughs> field research in neuroscience, vertebrate paleontology, and human anatomy. And right now I'm finishing my master's in bioanthropology and archaeology, which is studying humans as an animal and trying to understand their evolutionary history with a thesis in paleo uh, environmental reconstruction through stable isotopic analysis of a 1.5 million year old dig site in Ubadi, Israel. <laughs> so like that's, that's like, what that? I do. You know? Everybody gets that? that. But yeah, it's but on a you... business card. It's it's one very long business oh, card. Oh my God, that was amazing. Um, so, but the renegade but, science teacher, what, what does that mean? Well, renegade science teacher is something that I derived uh, because I've been teaching science informally for almost 10 years. Um, I... I go to, to schools and to summer camps and to libraries and to colleges, and I, uh, I do big, exciting demonstrations and assemblies or like in-class workshops and, and, and classes and things like that, whatever it takes to get people excited about science. And for the past uh, uh, almost 10 years now, I've taught in front of groups of one student to over a thousand people in an audience at a time, doing all sorts of different things. And I've done this for several different companies and several different uh, uh, educational institutions. And every single time there were a bunch of rules and caveats attached where it was like, hey, 
you know, you can't teach about evolution because I live in Oklahoma and people don't like that. Uh, I got in trouble one time for talking about how old the earth was. Uh, I got kicked out of a school one time because I talked about nucleosynthesis and stars and where new atoms came from. And the kids went home and said, hey, mommy, the stars made me, not God. And then I got a bunch of angry emails and my boss called me like, what the hell are you doing? So like this, uh, I, I just got really, really frustrated with being told what I can't teach. Um, especially when the kids are driving the conversation. I'm a very uh, 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 progressive teaching style, that kind of question-based learning um, and getting kids excited about, about you know, the, the lesson plan uh, because that's how you make more scientists. I once yeah. taught a, a group of third graders and one of the kids asked me, you know, it was the same thing with stellar nuclear synthesis. They asked me how stars work and we talked about it for like 30 minutes. We talked about where atoms come from and how new atoms are made and, and how supernovae happen and all sorts of cool stuff. They don't remember one thing that I said, but they remember how much fun they had learning and they remember exactly. that there were answers to those questions <clears throat> and that makes scientists. And so I decided to start doing my own thing and teaching my own way and teaching the things that actually matter to people like race, gender, uh, 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 evolution, all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, and uh, renegade science teacher was my, my mode of doing that. And now uh, I've kind of stuck. I got stuck with the name because now <laughs> we've gotten these channels too big and I don't think I can change it because I'd rather just be called forest, but uh, it's, it's, hey, it's something just, it's the brand that makes sense to me because it's, you know, I'm going to teach all the science all of the time, um, whether you like it or not. That. I love that. <laughs> so the, yeah. The schools want you to come teach science, but not too much. Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and like, I got, you know, I, I got in trouble at one job for not teaching exactly what was on the script and you're supposed to teach exactly this lesson plan. I'm like, that sucks. Have you ever been in a class where somebody does that? It sucks. Yeah. You want somebody who's excited and wants to talk to you. No one's going to learn if I do it that well, way. So, I can, I can it, only imagine possible. how, engaged the kids are at your presentation because you are so ex yeah, you make learning sound fun i mean i think i think that's the key and it that means the world it, to me thank you you make it sound exciting and 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 even though you use a lot of big words and say i'm really fast still <laughs> i can tell there's a lot of good stuff in there i'd rather um, over teach and under teach i remember one time i was in a physics class in college and the professor started explaining something and he was like uh, this is over your head. So I, I was pissed. I stayed after class. I, like, I want you to teach this to me. Like I'm one of your grad students. Tell me that. Yeah. And it made perfect sense. It was so easy. It just, if yeah. you weren't talking to me, like I'm stupid, I wouldn't assume that I am. It's like, yeah, I, no, I agree with that. Teaching. I kids agree with that. that. The kids are going to, they're going to come up to that level. If you expect them to, the kids will exactly. come to the level that, that's expected of them is what I've seen, but I'm exactly. seeing in the chat, several people wanting to get you on their shows. And you know, when we talked the other day and I learned that you were in Tulsa, I said, okay, I've got to connect you with, with Seth Andrews because yeah. he lives there and um, I, you two need to meet each other. And so I'm going, that. I'm going to uh, reach out to him and send you, send him this show and had, let him see what, what you're doing. I think he would, sure. I think he would love to have you a guest on his show and you guys could collaborate. I'm, I'm not sure how far apart you live from each other, but he's, Right there on the outskirts of, of uh, Tulsa. I think you're in Broken Arrow. I th you told me that's out, outside Tulsa. That but used to be. And now I'm more in Tulsa now, but it doesn't matter. Okay. It's, it's, it's such a, you can trip and fall in Broken Arrow and land in Tulsa. So like it's, yeah. it, they're all right there. <laughs> so he, I, I just know he's going to want to meet you and, and connect with you. So we'll get you guys connected. I think that'd be fun. I would love, and, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So anything Genevieve. So yeah, he's, he's brilliant and he's such a good guy. You'll enjoy meeting him. Uh, Genevieve, any parting thoughts? We've got a couple of minutes. Gosh, I mean, I like I said, I've just been I've been looking forward to this and having you on for for so long. And in fact, you you remind me so much of the science educators that I grew up with because you know I I am not from the Bible Belt. I grew up a couple blocks away from the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Uh, when I was four, I used to love playing with a slide. I was like, mom, look, I'm playing with gravity. It's so cool. Um, yeah, dude. I was, yeah, I was that kind of <laughs> kid. Uh, I lived there and breathed there. I did all of my like science summer camps and it was just, you know, you can tell when, when I, this is why I love scientists because you guys get so geeky about these things that you love so, so much. And it just warms my heart. I just, I, <laughs> you're, you're giving the best <laughs> example because you everybody's born a scientist, yo, yeah, because of yeah. what you just said. You're 
dicking around with the universe. Look at the, the babies, man. Babies yeah. knock things over. They put things in their mouths. They tear shit apart. They're exploring. You yeah. growing up playing with a slide. I'm pointing over here like you're fucking over here. But like you playing <laughs> with a slide and stuff. You're yeah. experimenting. You're learning how the world works. That's awesome. Yeah. And if we yeah. can spend the first two years of a kid's life teaching them how to walk and talk and then the next 12 years in school teaching them to shut up and sit down, we'd have a yeah. lot more scientists out there. Exactly. You know, I, I, when I did right. go the Bible Belt, uh, I was I was reading the Bible um, to see what, what all the fuss was about because uh, yeah. my friends were really into it. And and uh, my friend had told me, there's like, no, you need to read it with childlike faith. I was like, oh, you did not know me as a child. Because <laughs> I, yeah, you know, kids, we want to pick things apart. And I love, I love science educators that can sort of give kids permission mm -hmm. to do that. I think that we would be a, in a much better place. <laughs> If yeah. kids did not have that sort of curiosity stifled. So you know, thank so I, you. I did the same thing. I, I grew up I grew up in the buckle of the Bible belt, never read the damn thing. But when I actually got around to it, I, I brought this in here just in case. And like <laughs> I absolutely just like tore it apart and went yeah. through it and made so many notes. And like the, the, the margins are black with with just writing and scribblings and everything. And like it's ah, it makes it so much more fun. And you won't oh, yeah. fall into the trap if you actually read it critically. I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, how can we reach you? Um, how can people find you, your website, your YouTube yeah, channel? So, those kind uh, of things? Right now, my website is called renegadescienceteacher.com. I'm shifting the domain over to Valkai Labs at the end of the year. It doesn't fucking matter. You can find me all over the place. Just look up Forrest Valkai. Um, yeah. I'm on TikTok. I'm on YouTubes. I'm on uh, uh, Instagram. Sometimes I remember that I have a Twitter. Uh, and, and those are all places that you can see the stuff that I do. Um, uh, gosh, what else? What else? Um, if uh, I'm currently Belvin sport team sees you want to clean up the ocean, please do that. Uh, and more than anything, uh, two, two big messages for the Christians watching, please don't ever say Jesus loves you. It's an incredibly hurtful thing to say. You've, you've heard how we talked about how it teaches religion teaches that you're sick and you're broken. When you say that, I know you think it sounds nice, but all I hear is, Hey, you're a disgusting piece of trash. And if you grovel a little bit, maybe you're worthy of love. I think everybody's worthy of love. So please don't say that to me. And the second thing also for all the non, or for really everybody watching, just remember that you're cool and you should never stop learning because the universe is awesome. And the second that you start questioning everything, assuming nothing and just following the evidence, no matter where it leads, this whole bitch is your playground. So go That's have right. fun and explore and learn some things. Make this world your bitch, man. That's what Absolutely. the message is. <laughs> Well, that's a great message, man. I uh, I am just thrilled. I know Neil, the 604 Atheist, is on here. He's going to be reaching out to you. I think Captain Dadpool sure. is going to be reaching out. We're going to have get you on I some I follow more him shows. as well. Yeah. Um, and hit the like and subscribe, folks. If you can support us on Patreon, that would be awesome. Any little bit helps. And thank you for what we're doing. Next week, we're going to be doing a show on ALS. Uh, I've Ooh. been, as you know, I, I live with ALS. Um, I don't know if you knew that for us, but... Yes. Um, we're, we're having a show on ALS. We've got Indu Navar, who's the founder and CEO of an organization that Bevan and I are connected with called Everything ALS. If you know anyone, people who are touched by ALS, who are living with it, we'd love to get you to call in next week. We're going to talk about better ways to diagnose and treat this horrible disease because right now it's kicking ass and we got to change that narrative. Um, but that's that's next week's show. And Forrest, it was been so fun, man. You're a great guest. Uh, we had a blast oh, yeah. and we learned a lot. Genevieve, it was great again. And everybody, thanks for tuning in. And that's our show for tonight. This was a lot. Of